Okay, so here we go. It's going to be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's all of the Torah. Easy, right? So easy. It's five books. Man, we got this. Let's do it again a couple of times, and then we're going to hit record. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's all of the Torah. One more time. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's all of the Torah. Who feels like they know it? Yeah? Okay. So here, press record on your phone. Andy, I don't see record, baby. <laughs> Not even you're getting out of this one. <laughs> Here we go. Record. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's all of the Torah. Okay, stop. So throughout this week, I challenge you to go through and find that song, and just sing it in the car. My gosh, we spend, you know, how many minutes in the car every day going back and forth to somewhere, and that song's so short and so sweet and so simple, but it's the first five books of the Bible. Easy peasy, right? And then we're going to get into, uh, like, the Tin Little Indian songs, One Little, Two Little, Three Little Indian. That's what the second section's going to be. And then the third section is a song that I made up that you won't know, but it's catchy and cute, and it's what actually we taught our Baptist kids. So there you go. That's what we start out with tonight. We're going to start doing that every single week, and one day I'm going to call one of y'all up and ask you to sing it. I'm just kidding. I really won't do that. Maybe I'll ask Sabrina to do it. <laughs> You'll call someone your lifeline. All right, let's start out with prayer. Lord, I thank you for these people, God. I thank you so much for these people who have taken the time out of their busy schedules to come and learn and sit at your feet and learn your word. God, thank you for your word, God. Thank you that you took the time to speak to several different authors of this Bible, God, to, to take time to write it out, God, and many of them giving their lives for what they did. And God, help us to never forget, God, what amazing amounts of blood have been shed for this book right, God, right here, God, in our hands. Thank you, God, that we can take that commitment that those people did, Father, and carry it on out, Father, and uh, let us each be disciples to other disciples who are disciples to other disciples, God, and let this continue on for generations to come. Um, Lord, I praise you, and I thank you for the people that are online watching, God. I pray that they get as much as we are right here, right now, and uh, God, I just pray blessings over everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're going to start out with a review from last week. Can anybody tell me, how many books are in the Bible? 60, good, good, 66. How many are in the Old Testament? 39. Anybody remember how many are in the New Testament? 27. Excellent. You guys are awesome so far. What's our first section over here? Foundational. What are our books in the foundational? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All of those go into the foundational section. So the foundational section is the Torah, and it's going to be five books. Okay, what do we got in this next section? Historical. Historical. So we got Joshua through Esther here. How many books? Twelve. Good. And then the last one, we have instructional. How many books in the instructional section do we have? Twenty-two. Awesome. And we learned those are the um, prophetic books, and then we also learned that those are like the poetical books. So what we learned here is that this is your foundational. This was where the law is given. This is basically the laws of life that were given through Moses that he wrote down over many years. Uh, and that this book is basically telling us how to live our life. And then we take that and we use it in the historical section. And these people are living out those laws. And then the instructional section is written back to these people in the historical section, telling them, hey, you're getting off track here. You're not obeying these foundational sections. So it's basically, you know, shape up or ship out kind of situation with the instructional books. And then we also learned in the instructional books that there was post-exile, exile, and pre-exile and the different areas that these different prophecies were given to. And so 
let's go down to a very basic um, outline. Somebody said, you know, you kept saying, I assume you know this, but <laughs> I, I'm learning. I don't need to say that, that I need to be like, bring it down, I guess, to like how I would teach the fifth graders, right? So there was Adam and Eve. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to get that simple. But truly, there was Adam and Eve, and then there was uh, Noah. But then the guy that I really want to focus on here is we've got Abraham, old Abe. Abe came into the scene about 2000 B.C., Abe had a couple of sons, but we're just going to focus on Isaac here. And then Isaac had some sons as well, but we're just going to focus on Jacob. You guys remember how many sons Jacob has? Twelve. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. The eleventh one, what was his name? Joseph. Joseph. Excellent. Joseph was the favorite of Jacob. Remember that? Okay, so we've got Abraham who establishes. When Abraham came on the scene, it was very popular to believe in multiple gods, like hundreds of gods. And Abraham came on the scene and believed in one God. He was the guy that made it cool to believe in one God. And he was the father of faith. You know, he simply believed that God was, and it was honor to him as righteousness. So you've got Father Abraham here, and then you have Isaac, who basically comes and lives in the land of Canaan, which was promised to Abraham. And so he brings his family, and they live in Canaan. And then you've got Jacob right here, who is the son of Isaac. And Jacob is renamed Israel. Very good. He's renamed Israel in uh, Genesis 32, 29. Do you guys remember when he was renamed Israel? Exactly, when he fought with the angel, who he turned and said, I just fought with God. I just saw God face to face. And he turned, the angel turned to Jacob and said, you are no longer Jacob, your name is Israel. And so these kids down here became known as the children of Israel, or the tribes of Israel. Okay, so then we've got Joseph, who was favored by Jacob, but the rest of the family was very jealous that he was a favorite, and sold him into slavery, so Joseph goes into slavery. He's taken into Egypt. He's taken into G Egypt out of the land of Canaan. And as he goes into the land of Egypt, he finds incredible favor. He immediately gets into Potiphar's house, who is like the head honcho. And he helps Potiphar out. And then he goes to prison in Potiphar's house. And he's there for about 20 years. 20 years goes by. Jacob, in the meantime, thinks that Joseph is dead. These family members go ahead and move on with their lives. They all have kids and wives and everything. But then a major, major famine comes upon the Mesopotamia area, also on Canaan. And so these people are going to starve to death, literally, if they don't go get help. And because Joseph was in Egypt, he found such favor there that he actually became second in command, and he helped them take care of Egypt so that Egypt would not suffer from the famine. And so people that were suffering from the famine were taking strolls to Egypt, basically, to get help. And so lo and behold, the family of Jacob goes to Egypt and actually, 20 years later, meets up with Joseph, and Joseph takes care of his family. The head honcho of Egypt says, hey, let your whole family come on, live in Egypt, and be a part of us. And so the whole tribe of Jacob, the whole tribe of Israel came to Egypt. They live with Joseph, and they prosper and have a great time. And then eventually that head honcho guy dies, and the, the Egyptians start treating these guys and their family members terrible, and they're all taken into slavery for 430 years, is what the Bible says. There's a lot of debate on that. There's a lot of debate that says it was only 250-something years. Others say, yeah, it was over 400 years. I don't know. All I know is a long time, and they were treated terribly in Egypt. And so they started crying out and saying, oh, and by this point, they're in Egypt over 400-something years. There's millions of them by this point. There's millions of uh, Israelites in Egypt by this point. And they're, they're seen as very jealous of these people. The Egyptians don't like the Israelites. But the Israelites are crying out, God, you've got to help us. You've got to help us. Send us somebody to help us. And so who comes on the scene? Moses. 
So Moses is about 1500. Remember I told you guys don't get nitpicky on me here. I mean, <laughs> approximately 1500 BC. You can argue with that. It could have been 1450. But the idea is it's about 500 years later, Moses is in Egypt now. And Moses comes in, and he comes in and helps all the tribe of Israel out of slavery. And for the rest of the foundational books, from uh, Exodus through uh, Deuteronomy, it's basically all of this tribe, the millions of them coming out of Egypt, out of slavery, and wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. So far, so good, right? I mean, that's pretty, I think, pretty simple, right, Pastor? <laughs> okay, so... Uh, that is what's happening in the foundational section. When they do come, uh, when they do come out of Egypt and they come to a mountain called Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, they get to this mountain and uh, God talks to Moses and gives Moses the Ten Commandments and also what they call 613 or oral laws. So not only do you have 10 commandments, if you also got like 613 other laws that God gives Moses. And during this time of wandering in the wilderness for those 40 years, Moses is writing all of this down, writing down this historical part of, of what happens in, in, uh, around Mount Sinai. So there came a point where Moses said, let's try to go into the promised land. Uh, in numbers, they count how many warriors they have ready to go in and take over the promised land. That was promised to Abraham over 500 years ago. So they go to the promised land. They send 12 of their guys to go out and scout it out. You remember the story. They all come back, minus two of them. The 10 of them say, there is no way. These guys are huge. Everything about it is amazing, but there's no way we could win. And so they doubt that God ever promised Abraham, you know, the land of Canaan. They doubt everything that God told them. And so God said, because you doubted me, you're going to be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And they said that that really tested Moses and his leadership. As you can only imagine, they say that Jewish people are very um, strong-willed. <laughs> They're very, very strong-willed. So for Moses to have to be a leader over a million-plus strong-willed people apparently tested Moses quite a bit as well. So 40 years comes and goes. It's time to finally go back into the land of Canaan and try to take it back over. Uh, and Moses has a, a leader that he has trained. Do you guys remember what his name is? Joshua. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. So Moses, he is over uh, on the side looking into the promised land, knowing that he'll never get over there. I mean, there's, there's a really cool map that Andy and I have now that literally shows you it's 3D, like you can touch it, and it'll show you the geography of the land over there, and you can actually see this mountain that Moses stood on and looked over at the promised land and could see this wide range of everything God had promised his people, but he himself was not going to be able to go over there. So we see Moses dying, Joshua takes over, an incredible battle warrior guy here. He goes and he fights Jericho, and then they fight several cities, and over about a seven-year period, they do, take o they do take over the land of Canaan. They make it Israel. The 12 tribes that we have right here, they all split up into their own little tribes over in Israel, and they each have their own little spots and places that they live and live happily ever after, right? Not really. <laughs> Okay, so, so far, so good. So we've got our foundational section that we just discussed. Now we just moved into our historical section where you've got Joshua fighting the battles. And then the rest of the history is where we've got the kings coming into the picture. We've got judges and things of that nature. So if you guys remember, the first thing that we have happening is we've got all these guys making their tribes in Israel. I mean, yeah, in Israel. And then uh, we have... Judges ruling over them. Do you guys remember anything about the judges? Were they good? Were they bad? Mostly really bad. <laughs> Mostly really bad. So you had really bad judges looking over all the tribe of Israel, um, and that was for several years. And finally, the people are crying out, we want a king, we want a king like all the other nations. And so God finally says, okay, you get your king. And who's their first king? Saul. So Saul comes on the picture as the first king. By all means, this guy should have been a wonderful king. He was, uh, he was well built. Apparently he was really good looking. He had a strong leadership ability to him, but he just didn't quite work out because it was like his, his heart was never for Israel. His heart was always for himself. He did things that God told him not to do. Um, and so he was not, ended up, it was not a good king. So who comes next in line? 
David. David comes next in line, Saul dies. All these guys rule for about 40 years, by the way. David comes on the, the scene here. David's got a heart pure as gold. He loves Israel. He loves his land, and he'll do anything for it. Now, granted, just like any normal man, he has his things about him that weren't so good. You know, he's just human. But he was a good, good leader. And that was what they call like the pinnacle of the Hebrew historical part of their life. It was like the best part of Israel's life was when David was king. Okay, so David comes, he dies. Who comes next? Solomon. Solomon also reigns 40 years, approximately. He was also a good king, but as he got towards the end of his reign, not so good, right? So we found out towards the beginning, he had a great heart, but as he got towards the end, he married too many women. <laughs> he married too many women, he had too many gods, he was trying to make too many people happy, and he ended up, his heart just wasn't quite for Israel anymore. So it was good, it was not so good. And so at the end of his life, Solomon had the end of his reign, and his son comes onto the scene, and you guys remember what happens then? The kingdom divides. So we've got the kingdom divides because his son goes up and decides to tax the people even more. They can't stand him, and so the northern ten tribes go off on their own, and they're called Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. And then the southern kingdom is called what? Judah, good. Southern kingdom of Judah, where's Jerusalem? Southern, Southern. good, right on the border. And then uh, Samaria is their kingdom, is their, what would you call that? Capital, is, is the northern Israel. Okay, so then what happens? Northern Israel, they get 19 kings in the process of this time that they're there, none good. As a matter of fact, they're really evil, all the kings that they get here. Not one is mentioned as being good in the Bible. And I'm talking bad kings. I'm talking like they would sacrifice their kids before going off to war kind of kings. You know, like just stuff that we couldn't even begin to imagine doing. They were doing to their, their people. Southern Judah had 20 kings, 19 kings, one queen. Eight of them were good. So... When it came time for northern Israel to be wiped out, who came and took them out? Assyria. So Assyria came over uh, and took over out north Israel. They tried to take over southern Judah, but they couldn't. But what happens is when Assyria, uh, when the Assyrian army comes in, what do they do to those ten tribes? They scatter them. And then what happens to them? They're never seen again, ever. We have no clue who those ten tribes, who, where they are anymore. So we've only got two tribes left down here in southern Judah. Andy pointed out that when we looked at the map last Wednesday, that if you recall, down in that southern kingdom, uh, S Simon, the tribe of S Simon, Simeon, Simeon, was down there in the south. If you noticed, hey, look at that. You guys are awesome. Okay, yes. So the question is, what happened? So they keep talking about the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin became, there's Benjamin, this is your southern kingdom right here, but there's Simeon right there. So why don't they ever mention Simeon every time they talk about the southern kingdom? That was such a mystery to Andy and I, so we had to obviously go look that up. Well, it ends up that Simeon was, well, basically Moses cursed Simeon. You can look that up yourself when you get home. But basically, the Simeon tribe became so small, it's like it just dissolved. So it's almost like it just, it just, it's one of those ten tribes that just disappeared. So in all reality, Benjamin and Judah were the only uh, tribes that were left in southern the kingdom of Judah. So I don't know if any of y'all noticed that, but that's where that came in. The other question that came in from last Wednesday is where did the term Jews come from? Anybody ever wonder that? Jews. Jews came from the word Judah. And when did it come in? It came in when actually northern Israel came down to fight southern Judah, and they talk about coming to fight the Jews. So that's where the first word of Jews is brought up, is because of southern Judah. Now, after that northern kingdom disappears, the word Israel, you know, it was the northern kingdom of Israel. After Judah came back, we'll get here in a sec, but after they came back to take back over their territory, they were just called Israel again. But don't let that confuse you. The, the northern kingdom of Israel is gone. But these guys are called Israelites again. 
Okay, so the northern kingdom's gone. They're scattered all over the region, and as they're scattered, other people come into their region because that's what Syria does. And so you've got all these mishmash of people. You've got half Jews, half Gentiles, and they're all intermarrying, and they become, what do they become? Samaritans. And Judah, Jews, hate Samaritans, and Samaritans hate Jews. Like, they don't associate with each other at all, okay? Okay, so about 100... 25 years later, southern Judah turns bad, and who comes and takes over southern Judah? Babylon. What happens to them? They get exiled into Babylon for how many years? 70 years. Exactly. Okay, 70 years comes up. What happens to Babylon? Persian Empire comes in and takes over Babylon. So then what does the Persian Empire do to southern Judah? Sends them back home. And what do they do when they get back home? They rebuild. So then you've got Ezra and Nehemiah on the picture there. Ezra was, they said if there wasn't a Moses, then Ezra would have been the Moses. I mean, Ezra apparently was an amazing scribe, an amazing teacher that just loved his people and wanted them to, you know, prosper. And so Nehemiah and Ezra were sent back to Judah, to southern Judah, to rebuild their wall, to rebuild their temple, and to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, so in the meantime of all of that history happening, uh, we come down here to the instructional section, and when, while this is all happening, we've got all these prophets giving words back to all these people during this whole history of saying, if you don't shape up, something's going to happen. You guys are going to get taken over, and of course, they pretty much all did. And we learned that we get to Malachi, which is our last book of the Bible in the Old Testament, and Malachi is the last prophet we hear from in the Old Testament, and then it's just pure silence. No more words out of a prophet for 400 years, so they say. <laughs> okay, so that was what we talked about over an hour and a half last week in the Old Testament. <coughs> so now we're going to move to the silent years, which to me are so flipping cool. Here we go. Silent years are 400 years between your Old Testament and your New Testament. And that's where we're going to start. I think God is so cool. <laughs> when I started realizing everything that he did in that 400 years time to get the scene perfectly right for the appearance of Christ, I mean, he couldn't have orchestrated it any better. It's really, really cool. Okay, so what we have is we have several different rulers. We're going to look at different things of what happened during that 400 years. The first thing we're going to look at is the rulers. Now, first of all, we had Persia. Remember, Persia was on the scene. We just saw them. I'm going to erase this over here. This is where I think you guys like have fill in the blanks. Is that right? So we got Persia. I can't remember how many links I have for you guys. Okay. The first one we got is your ruler, and your first ruler is Persia. And we saw them. We know, we know them. The date is 538 BC. What they had to, um, what they contributed to this 400 years of silence is that they allowed the Judeans, the Judeans to go back home and rebuild their temple. Their first temple that Solomon built was demolished. Things were taken out. I mean, it was demolished. Everything was gone. And so they had to go back home and rebuild their second temple. You'll hear a lot about the second temple as we go into the book of John. So second temple is rebuilt here. And that's all because they allowed their people to go back home and rebuild. Persians believed if you let people go back to their homeland, they wouldn't rebel, rebel and they would build themselves back up that way. Okay, so that's Persia, and we know about them. Okay, next, come on the scene, is going to be Greece. Your year is going to be 332 B.C. This is Alexander the Great. Everybody heard of Alexander the Great? Maybe some point in your history? <laughs> Alexander the Great is the one that comes in and does this major conquest, and he destroyed the Persian Empire. But some cool things that he did is that he continued to allow that Judean nation to rule themselves. So he let them still kind of like have their own independence, although he oversaw it. But they still were able to watch over them own, their own selves. But what here, what really happens that's awesome, is that the Greek language becomes the dominant language of the region. So to me, the Greek language is what the major thing that they contribute here. 
They also institute the Sanhedrin, which is the one that sees over the civil law of the Jewish nation. We're going we're gonna to read a lot about them when we get into John, and so we'll talk about the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and all of that come January. But mainly what I think is really cool right here is that Greek language. So everybody starts to speak Greek. And they conquer a huge amount of the empire. So I'm talking all over the region. Everybody's speaking Greek. Everybody. It's kind of like how English is spoken all over the world now. That's kind of that idea. Like everybody speaks that language. If it's not their dominant language, it's like second. So that's a huge contribution right there. Then we've got what's called the Maccabees. Maccabees. And this is a Jewish tribe. So they're Jewish. The year here is going to be 164 BC. So these are pretty good amounts of time that these different people are ruling, by the way. Notice that. Okay, the Maccabees, what's going on with them is they've got independent rule. The Maccabees come in and... Uh, they take over their region again. It's a Jewish tribe. They're able to take back over Israel. And basically, they have a period of independence again. Now, what does that mean? Why is that important? The reason that's important is because when Greece was ruling, they took on basically a Hellenistic viewpoint, meaning they had tons of gods again. So by the time the Maccabees take back over, what they do is they bring back in their one god. So I put one god here. They get back to that one God, and they're always looking for hope of the Messiah. The Maccabees are hoping for the Messiah. Notice the date, 164 B.C. We're still about 164 years out before Christ is born. But nonetheless, they have hope that a Messiah is coming. Okay, so let's stop here, because we still have one more to go. But because we love the Jewish people, and I love history, do you guys know what we're celebrating right now? Or do you know what Jews are celebrating right now? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. And do you know why we celebrate that? No. Okay, cool. Because the Maccabees. Maccabees, right here, they come and Greece took over the Ju Judean area, the southern Judah area where all these people were living. And these people came in, the Greece, the Alexander the Great came in and he destroyed their you know, temple again and like, did all these bad things, and he was like making um, pigs be uh, sacrificed on their altars in the temple. And if you know anything about Jews, that is so not kosher, right? So, I mean, he was like making them do terrible things to their temple, and they weren't allowed to um, worship their God anymore. And, you know, wh where's my uh, Wednesday night crew that I, <laughs> what's the one thing we talked a lot about on Wednesday night, the circumcision? They weren't allowing their kids to be circumcised anymore, and if they were getting their kids circumcised, they were actually like putting the babies around the mom's necks and killing the mom and the baby at the same time, and I mean, they were just being really, really evil. And so you got these, it's five or six brothers. Anybody remember how many Maccabees there are? Five or six brothers, five. Five brothers decide enough's enough. And so they know that this army is coming into their region again, and they want to take it over, take over this army, and destroy them and take their land back. And so they come in, and the Maccabees, you know, get a, an army together, and they take over this army coming into their region, and they get to take back over their land. But when they came back into their temple, and they wanted to take the temple back to themselves, one thing that they always had in the temple burning at all times was a menorah. And so when, they, when, you, when you light your menorah, it has to be with purified olive oil. So if you want to light your menorah, you have to have purified olive oil. And these people, because of who was there before, their olive oil is no longer pure, and they only had enough olive oil to light one light. But it just so happened that that one light lasted eight days, which was enough time to get another thing of olive oil purified so that they could light the menorah again. And so what we're celebrating Hanukkah for is to celebrate taking back over their area and also that God was so faithful to give them eight days worth of olive oil. And so what are they doing tonight? They're going, tonight's the second night. For if you're a Jewish person, tonight you're lighting your second candle. And then because it's all about oil, they like to do a lot of fried food. So they have a lot of fried food going on right now, and they have prayers that they say. And then they're supposed to take that menorah with that second candle lit, and they're supposed to put it into their window to basically represent God and the light of the world. 
So that's what the Jewish people right now, wherever they are, they're celebrating Hanukkah right now. And that's because of this, the Maccabees. Okay, so then the Maccabees get in an argument several years later about who's going to take over. And so Rome comes in and decides, well, you guys can't decide who's going to take over, so we're just going to take over. And that's 63 B.C. So we got Rome here, 63 B.C. So Rome, this is stinking cool right here, man. <laughs> so Rome comes in and they take over. Not that that's cool because, I mean, that's not, that's not awesome. But they still let the Jerusalem people have a little bit of autonomy. Like they still got to rule over themselves, but still Rome was over there overseeing everything. But this is where the world that Christ comes into. And what Rome does is they go build thousands upon thousands upon thousands, like 50,000 miles of roads over the Roman Empire. And so what that does is it allows, put roads there, it allows the traveling of all the apostles and all the disciples and everybody's about to come on the scene here in 63 plus years, it allows them to travel all over the Roman Empire to deliver the message of Christ. Now what also else happens right here in Rome is Rome keeps the Greek language. So everybody still has the same language. So not only do you have like 50,000 miles of paved roads, or something like 200,000 miles of unpaved roads that they make as well. So you've got tons of roads, and you've got the same common language going on there. And one other thing that you have coming onto the scene is you've got the Septuagint Bible. Anybody know what the Septuagint Bible is? Exactly. It's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So that means that anybody in that region was able to read the Bible because it was translated into their common language. So anybody that was in that northern tribes that, that got dispersed, that couldn't read the Bible anymore because they were, you know, they intermarried and had a whole different language, well, finally, they're able to read again. They're able to read about what happened in the Hebrew empire, basically, what happened in the Hebrew history. So we've got Rhodes there. Also, when Rome com comes onto the scene, by the way, it's 63 to 135 A.D. That's how long they're going to be ruling, 135 A.D. 63 B.C. to 135 A.D. So in other words, this is where Christ is. Christ is going to be under the Roman rule. Um, it's also what's called a period of Pax Romana. Anybody knows what that means? Roman peace. Roman peace. It means it was a period of peace for the Roman Empire. So that means, once again, all these people that were disciples and apostles, they could travel the Roman roads in peace. They didn't have to worry about, basically, they didn't have to worry about getting murdered or hurt or anything like that nature. So do you see all the cool stuff that contributed to this point where Christ comes on the scene? You got the second temple rebuilt that will not be destroyed until after Christ is gone. When does the second temple end? 70, 70 A.D., so we got that second temple rebuilt. Then we got the common Greek language that everybody is going to speak when it comes time to spread the message of the gospel. Then we've got the Maccabees coming back to the one God with the hope of the Messiah coming soon. And then the Maccabee reign ends, and we've got Rome coming into the picture in 63 B.C. Rome has an amazing period of peace. They also build all of these road systems, and when they build all of these road systems, they build major cities everywhere so that you're going to see lots of churches popping up into all these different major cities. And, uh, and then they continue having the Greek language. And then we also have right around here is where the Septuagint Bible, I think it was between 200, 250 B.C. is where the Septuagint Bible is brought into the picture. So all of that together during the silent years is what's going on behind the scenes. And everything that I have there in the box is going to contribute to Christ and his message. Everything. So I ask you right now, do you feel like you're in a silent period? Like where have you gone, God? Like, I feel like nothing's going on in my life that you said was going to go on. But what you've got to realize is a lot of times it's silent because God's working behind the scenes for you. It's like he's laying out everything perfectly so that when it's your time to go for your destiny or your purpose, it's there, you know? If something would have happened here, if Christ had come here, like in the second temple region, they wouldn't have had their common language, you know? The message could not have spread so easily because people couldn't have understood them, right? You know, so... Christ came on the scene at the perfect moment in history so that his message could spread. Anybody got any questions about the 400 silent years? 
Y'all good? Okay. I'm going to erase this. Hope you had the notes. Okay, so now we get to move into the Old Testament, and we get to do it in 15 minutes. Woo! I mean the New Testament. <laughs> we will quit at 8 o'clock tonight, so whatever we don't get done, don't worry, we'll get it next week. Oh, I wanted to tell you a little interesting thing, because I love interesting history. Uh, this is about the Septuagint version of the Bible. I found this this evening, and I thought it was just so cool. So where's the word Septuagint actually come from? What does it mean? Well, the word it means is 70, and it's because according to the traditional account of its origin, preserved in a letter from Aristeus, it had 72 translators, so they named it Septuagint for 70, go figure. Okay, but this letter, and then there's several letters actually from that historical time period that talk about the Septuagint Bible being created. But this letter shows how King Ptolemy II commissioned the royal librarian to collect copies of all books of all over the world, um, so basically, here's what this king did. He wrote a letter to Eleazar, the high priest at Jerusalem, requesting six elders of each tribe, in total 20 or 60, uh, 72 men of exemplary life and learned in the Torah to translate it into Greek. So 72 guys from the tribes come together to recreate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. So on arrival at Alexandria, the translators were greeted by the king and given a sumptuous banquet. They were then closeted in a secluded house on the island of Pharos, close to the seashore, while the, where the celebrated High Lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, had just been finished. So they're there with this amazing lighthouse that's one of the amazing wonders of the world. And according to this letter that they have, the translation made under the direction of Demetrius was completed in... 72 days. So these guys completed the whole Hebrew Bible in 72 days, translated it into the Greek language. When the Alexandrian Jewish community assembled to hear a reading of the new version, the translators and Demetrius received lavish praise, and a curse was pronounced on anyone who should alter the text by addition, transposition, or omission. The work was then read to the king, who, according to this letter, marveled at the mind of the lawgiver. The translators were then sent back to Jerusalem, endowed with gifts for themselves and the high priest. <laughs> so that's how the Septuagint Bible came about. 72 guys came together in 72 days and translated that whole Hebrew Bible into Greek. Pretty cool, huh? Once again, that all happened during that 400 silent years. Okay, so we got this New Testament fill-in over here. We got our foundational books. How many are we going to have over here? Four. What do we got? Who's going to be in the foundational section? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Excellent. And then what do we got here in this area? Historical. One book, and it's Acts. Cool stuff happening in Acts, man. That's just an awesome book. And then we have Instructional, which just happens to have how many? 22 again. How cool is that? And these are all of our epistles, from the Pauline epistles to the general epistles. And there's 22 letters there. So the foundational section is the life of Christ. He's going to lay down how we are supposed to live and how we succeed in life, basically. The historical section is how this is lived out through the apostles and the disciples. And the instructional book, once again, just basically gives instruction back to these people trying to live out the history. And that's, it's the exact same thing as what was happening over in the Old Testament. We just have different books. Pauline epistles and general epistles are here, and I seriously doubt we're going to get to those tonight, but that's what's down there in the instructional section. Okay, so we're going to talk about this foundational section and probably end there tonight. You should have a chart. Once again, I'm a big chart fan. <laughs> okay. Somebody help me out. How many columns did I give you? Okay, our first book is going to be what? Matthew. Matthew is our first book in the foundational section. Anybody know what his trade was? Tax collector. Was he liked or not? No. Those tax collectors are called publicans, by the way. Probably going to run into that word when we get to John. Publican. 
not a Republican, but Publican, those are your tax collectors. They were Jewish people, but they worked for the Roman government. And what they did is they, gave, they went around and collected taxes for the Roman government, but the Roman government basically said, we don't want to be the ones hated. We want you to be hated, so they got Jewish people to do it. But they basically said, go around, get taxes for us, and then you can get as much as you want from the people as well. So take as much as you want to pocket for yourself, but make sure you get enough for us, you know? And so they were very hated. And Matthew's the first one to come out and say he's a sinner here, that he's a hated man. And so he's a publican, he's a tax collector. His audience is going to be a Jewish Christian audience. Christian, I'm going to be XN, that means Christian. And the reason we know that, we know that that's who he is writing to, is because Matthew puts more Old Testament quotes in his book than any other gospel does. Because, see, those Jewish people knew their Bible. So he knew that he could start quoting Old Testament scripture and they're going to know their Bible. So, Jewish Christian audience. His uh, features, uh, once again, has Old Testament references. That's something that's interesting about that, Old Testament references. Another cool thing here is, uh, well, let's go to our key point. His key point is that Jesus is king. Jesus is king is his key point. And everything Matthew says in his gospel is to point Jesus being the king. He's that Messiah. He's that Messiah that the Maccabees were trying to point towards, that hope that everybody had, that the Messiah was coming. So Matthew's on the scene talking to Jewish Christians saying, hey, you know, back in the Old Testament when you kept saying you're looking for that Messiah, that king that comes into the picture, he's here. That was him. Jesus is that Messiah that you were looking for. Jewish Christians, that's him. And so that's why he's laying all these Old Testament prophecies, saying he fulfilled those prophecies. Those prophecies that were said in the Old Testament, back in the instructional section, he fulfilled them. Jesus, the king, fulfilled those prophecies. And so that's what Matthew's trying to convince them, that that was the promised king. Another thing Matthew does is talks about when Jesus comes on the scene, the first thing he does is he looks for his disciples, right? When he goes into his ministry, what's the last thing he does? He tells them about the Great Commission. And he says, and you go into the world, go and make disciples, right? And what the cool thing is, is when you, when you phrase that go and make disciples, that make disciples is actually the stress on that sentence. The, the, sentence, the go is in your going, make disciples. So in other words, everybody in this room, whatever you're doing in your going, you're making disciples, like that's, you're not, even if you're not called to be a teacher, whatever you're doing, you're make, you are called to make disciples. In your going, Emily, whatever you do, you're making disciples in your little class with fifth graders, you know? You're making disciples there. So in your going, that's what you're doing. Okay, so um, basically Matthew's taken every chance to say, this, this was the king you were looking for. That's what Matthew's point is. And why was it put first? Because it was so natural of a progression coming out of the Old Testament. Because where does Malachi end? Malachi ends by talking about that Messiah that's going to be coming. And then you got 400 years of silence, right? And then you got John the Baptist coming in, the first scene of Matthew, you know, saying, here he is, the one that you've been looking for. 400 years of silence, and it's like, whoa, didn't we? That was what was the last written in the Old Testament, you know? And so it's just, it was a natural progression to put Matthew first right there. It's just just came so naturally. Next, we got Mark. Mark was a missionary. Missionary. His audience was Roman audience. They were Gentiles, in other words. He was a Roman, uh, he was a missionary to the Roman area. Uh, you know, he knew all of their ways. He knew everything about them. So in other words, if he's going to write a letter, this is the guy to do it, you know. He knew how to speak to them. Um, Mark is the shortest gospel. I thought that was kind of interesting. It's the shortest gospel that we have. Actually, yeah, shortest gospel. And he's also not real detailed because the next guy that comes on the scene, Luke, is crazy detailed. But Mark right before him is not so detailed. So not so detailed. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. But the main point that Mark has is Jesus is servant. But he is also a sacrifice. So basically, he's telling the Roman people that Jesus came to serve, not to be served. 
And why that's important, because he's speaking to the Roman people, remember where our audience is, and in Rome, they believe that to move up to leadership, you serve. You don't just start out as a leader, you serve to get to be a leader. And that's what Christ did. He came and he served, he didn't come to be served. And so that was Mark's point, talking to the Romans, the Gentiles, is this guy is a lot like you, he came and he served, and he is like a leader of all leaders now. And that was Mark's point. He came to serve. Um, the least will become the great. This is the greatest servant of all. In chapters 1 through 8 of Mark, it's basically about Christ being a servant. And then chapters 8 through the end is about his sacrifice. So he's a servant in the beginning, and then he's the great sacrifice. But it's not so detailed. And then we've got Luke coming into the picture. Dr. Luke. So he was a, a doctor, and he was also a historian. And man, was this guy detailed. Like, he, he did his homework, you know, before he wrote his letters. He did his homework to know exactly what happened with Christ. Uh, let's go over to his key point. Jesus is the perfect son of man. Perfect son of man is what Luke's point is. His audience is Gentiles. Luke is not Jewish. Um, his audience is Gentiles. He's really into details. He's a detail kind of guy. He, basically, what he is showing is that the man of Christ, he was the perfect man, and not only was he a man, but he was basically the son of man. And he talks all about his humanity. And in Luke, he mentions more women and more children than any of the other Gospels. Basically, what Luke does is he shows how Jesus interacted with humanity. It was the human side of who Christ was. That's what Luke was all about. And then the last but not least, which is who we are going to start studying in January, is John. Anybody know what John's, what his trade was? Fisherman. Fisher. Man. His audience is the world. <laughs> Something interesting about John is it's usually the first gospel to be translated when people go out into missions field. If they're going to translate any part of the Bible, it's usually John that they translate first for the people. First gospel to translate. And then uh, he is going to talk about Jesus is the Son of God. He is the son of God. John, I'm telling you so many times, he says the word believe. We're, we'll get to there in January, but believe and you'll be saved. Believe and you'll be saved. Believe and you'll be saved. He says it numerous times. He also talks about several I am statements. Just to, You don't have to write these down because we will get to them. But I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Those are all things to point to John pointing to Jesus being the son of God. Something interesting up here, Jesus is king. What the first thing they start out with Matthew is, is talking about his genealogy, right? And they're trying to go back and point to the fact that Matthew uh, was in line to be king because he comes under David, as far as the genealogy goes. And uh, genealogy is huge, and we'll talk about that when we get to John, about you, they pride themselves on their genealogy. But Jesus is king, and their genealogy proves it here in Matthew. And Jesus is the son of God, and they talk about how he goes back to Abraham and Adam and Eve and the humanity and all of that jazz. So that is the foundational books in a nutshell. Anybody have any questions? No? I mean, you guys are easy tonight. 7.58. I promised Pastor Scott we'd stop at 8. <laughs> Anybody remember our uh, Books of the Bible song? <laughs> Andy's like, what was it? Okay, together, Mary, Mary, Mary had a little lamb. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's all of the Torah. 
Good job. We'll go over that again. It's on your phone. You got no excuses now. Uh, next week, what we're going to do is we're going to go fill in the historical acts. Stinking cool how that book is laid out. It's really, really exciting when you get to that. Uh, and then the instructional books, we got Pauline letters, Pauline epistles, and then the general epistles. And then that'll round out the New Testament. And then we are going to dive in as groups at our tables, learning how to... Um, Divide up scripture. I mean, we're, we're just going to learn it on our own. Uh, it's going to be exciting. We're all going to learn it together, and we'll just dive in, you know? Anybody have any questions about next week? All right, well, I want to encourage everybody to come Sunday. Can I make a plug, Pastor? <laughs> Sunday, I'll be preaching, and we're going to talk about the Jewishness of Jesus because it's just going to go just straight into what we're learning here. So we're going to talk about the Jewishness of Jesus and what Jesus' childhood looked like and everything that maybe you don't know because it's not written in the Bible, but when you go back to history, you know exactly how he was raised. And so that's what we'll talk about Sunday. So I invite you to come on Sunday and hear about that. Um, other than that, I'll end us out in prayer and then we'll call it a night. Lord, thank you for these beautiful people. Thank you, God, that we were able to focus and to learn about you. God, thank you that you are just an amazing God that works behind the scenes